Good morning. Good morning. Would you join me in our extravagant welcome? Everyone is welcome here. So good to see you this morning. Uh, we have some church members who have been out due to illness. Uh, we're welcoming them back. We have some guests from out of town who are here for the 60th anniversary, uh, I mean, uh, reunion of Suffolk High School. Uh, we have our families at home who join us by way of our DVDs and those who are with us by way of our website. Everyone is welcome here. Please, if you will, take the, I think it's yellow bulletin insert to look over the activities that are coming up. Uh, by the way, before I forget, right after the service downstairs, McKenna, hold up your hand, McKenna, there she is. She's, she's our number one Lambs Club member. Uh, she will be selling lemonade to, uh, for CHKD for children's cancer. She was out front yesterday and was it $70? $70.62 Friday, right out front on the, the walk there. So you can help her out uh, by purchasing some lemonade, and we thank you for your uh, mission project. Tomorrow evening is our monthly meeting of the Praying Church here in the sanctuary. Uh, I invite you to come. It's approximately 45 minutes of uh, just kind of quietness and meditation. No one is ever asked to pray out loud. However, you may do so if you uh, feel the uh, calling to do that. So please join us at that time. Also, toward the end of the week, we're still taking donations for the yard sale that will take place on the first Saturday in August, uh, which will be uh, um, um, for the Haiti mission. I, yeah, fundraiser for the Haiti mission. And then please uh, put on your calendar and make sure that you're here on the first Sunday of August. That's when we will honor Margaret Saunders, our 32-year veteran church secretary. In over 60 years, our church has only had two church secretaries, and I, that must be a record somewhere. And we're uh, delighted for her that she'll have more time with her family, uh, but we're certainly goodness sakes, we're going to miss her very, very much. So that'll be a uh, covered dish luncheon after church. We are blessed today <clears throat> with the flowers on the altar. They are in loving memory of Mary Opal Baker and S.A. Pinky Baker, and they're given by Gail and Vernon Taylor and their daughters, uh, Susanna and Jessica. As you are able, I invite you to stand as we sing How Firm a Foundation. to the Lord a new song, praise God in the assembly of the faithful. Let all God's children rejoice in their King. Rejoice in our God, give glory to God's holy name. Praise the Lord, sing to the Lord a new song. Come, Come let, let us, us worship, worship the Lord.
Our Heavenly Father, we thank you that you have called us to be your people. Thank you that you've called us to come together in your name, in your house. We pray that you would bless us today as we praise your holy name. And we pray this in the name of our Lord and our Savior, praying as he taught us, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. seated. <clears throat> Some of you may be aware that I had been collecting dimes in a two liter soda bottle and then taking them to the credit union and running them through the coin machine. Well, I got kind of an idea. I went in our pantry one day several months ago and uh, I had a gallon jug that had, used to have dill pickles in it and I ate the whole gallon, it, not in one day. So here was that jar, and I thought, why don't I collect all coins and put them in there? Well, you, you take a whole lot of coins and you put them in there, and it barely raises the amount at all. So it took several months, and I've been purchasing all of the coins that are, that are in our church offering. And finally, Friday, I took it to the credit union. And what do you think the amount was? I'm mean, just think for a moment. I had been getting 300, 350 of dimes in a two liter bottle. Someone have a guess? How much? $70.62 sold. Actually, it was $570. And it didn't feel like I spent that much money because it was just a little bit at a time. And that's kind of how we do stewardship. Uh, one person can't do it all, but mine plus yours and all of us working together certainly uh, will keep the Lord's work going. And I just rejoiced. Uh, and by the way, before I took the jar uh, to the credit union, I weighed it. Anybody have a guess what it weighed? 34 pounds. That's right. Now, that doesn't sound like a lot, but when you go to pick it up and realizing <laughs> that if you slip, you're going to have money everywhere. <laughs> so anyway, the, we, I got it there with, with no, no problems at all. We're walking by faith. We believe that God will supply all of our needs, and we thank you for your support of all of our missions and ministries. Let us now worship God with our tithes and offerings.
us pray. Heavenly Father, you are the owner and we are the managers of all that you entrust to us. Help us to live for you each day and to generously share the time, talents, and treasures you have given us. We pray this in the name of Jesus, who gave us life eternal. Amen. Thank you. Please be seated. <laughs> it's time for the Lambs Club. So far, we, we're putting the money here until we get our bank made. Ten. Oh, ten, ten quarters. Good. Anybody else? Okay. All right. Thank you. And since these two young ladies weren't here when we gave out the gift cards, there you are. Give it to your mama. Here is Lucy Lamb. Lucy Lamb. And here is... Yeah, maybe she's tired. Okay, there we go. And who is this? Lonnie, Lonnie Lamb. We, we, we're not sure what his name is. It's either Larry or Lonnie or something like that. So good morning to all of you. How are you doing? Good. What does Lamb's Club mean? Living as my Bible says. Let's say it together, okay? Living as my Bible says. And what does your Bible say to do every day? Be kind. Oh, my goodness, be kind. We need more of that in the world. Well, I'm going to tell you a story about a man who was never satisfied. Now, he needs a name. Now, since we're, I'll get those later. Um, since the Lambs Club, Lamb starts with L, we probably need his name to start with an L. What? what? Lonnie. Okay, his name is Lonnie. He was not happy. He just wasn't happy. So he said, I think what I'll do is buy me a sailboat and then I'll be happy. So he had this beautiful sailboat and he was out on the water, out on the water, and he kind of got tired of all the movement and he said, you know what, I think I better build me a house. Maybe then I'll be happy. So here he built him a house, okay? Like a roof. And he lived there a while and he said, you know what, I'm not happy. I think I need to go where I can be free. So he bought himself, uh, bought himself and, okay, she says it's an airplane. What do you all think? Airplane. Airplane? Everybody agree? Yep, he bought himself an airplane. But you know, after going through the air all the time and all the time, he was still not happy. So back at the airport, one of his friends said, I know a way that you can find happiness, not just for today, but forever. So he told him about a man named Jesus. You know, you know who Jesus is? Yeah. All right. And he talked about Jesus to the man and he said, if you'll give your heart to him, he'll love you and he'll even give you a home in heaven forevermore. And the man said, how is that possible? And the man, then his friend said, it's through the cross of Jesus. Okay? So Lonnie or Larry or whatever his name was, he found eternal happiness in Jesus through the cross. Okay? Now, I'm going to give this to the youngest member. Honey, would you look here? Would you like to have that? Okay, you, you can take that. Well, grab it. <laughs> you, you, you can carry it for her, okay? <laughs> okay, let's, wait a minute, let's, let's have our prayer. <laughs> okay, they're, all right. They, they can pray from their, their seat, okay? Let's hold hands. 
Dear Jesus, we thank you for loving us, and we thank you for giving us life eternal. Amen. By the way, I forgot to announce uh, earlier, you have in your uh, bulletin insert a, an invitation to a, just, just a time to get together, an indoor-outdoor party, stay inside with the AC, that's where I'll be, uh, or you can go outside to the hot tub or to the swimming pool. Uh, good food, good company, uh, you are guaranteed that, uh, so please RSVP. So Deb will know how much, uh, how much water to put in the soup, I guess, we'll put it that way. <laughs> I also wanted to announce to you that uh, next Sunday we will be receiving new members. And if the Lord is laying uh, that on your heart to come and join us, we would de be delighted for you to be part of that next Sunday. We, I have repeated this week the, uh, the uh, acrostic acts as a guide for your prayers. And I did want to uh, bring a, an update. Uh, Dorothy Judkins had been discharged from the hospital, but they had to take her back in. Uh, the, the medicine they gave her in going home was not taking care of the infection properly. So she is at the hospital right now being treated. Thank you for your prayers uh, for all of these. Let us pray.
Our Father, we thank you for being our God. We appreciate you. We uh, love you. We praise your power, your majesty. We thank you that you are the creator, that you keep things running in this earth. And we, your people, bow before you in worship this day. But Lord, we bring to you also our faults, our failures, and our sins, and we ask you, O Lord, to forgive us, to set us on the right path, and help us to live lives of uh, honor and lives of uh, being faithful to you every single day. We have so much to be thankful for, O Lord, especially for our church family, a place where we can know each other, where we can uh, share our burdens with each other, where we can lift the load with lots of help. We're never going to be perfect as a fellowship, but under your guidance, we certainly can be the best that we can. We ask you to bless each of these who are on our prayer list. We ask that you would bless all who are hurting in any way. Grant peace and wholeness to all especially to those who are suffering the loss of a loved one. We ask all of this, O oh God, believing that you hear us and that you will answer us through Christ Jesus, your only begotten Son. Amen.
Thank you. Our scripture lesson is from the fourth chapter of the book of Acts. The priests and the captain of the temple guard and the Sadducees came up to Peter and John while they were speaking to the people. Now this, you'll have to go back to chapter 3. They had healed a crippled man. They were greatly disturbed because the apostles were teaching the people and proclaiming in Jesus the resurrection of the dead. They seized Peter and John, and because it was evening, they put them in jail until the next day. But many who heard the message believed, and the number of men grew to about 5,000. Now that, I think, would also include the ones who were uh, saved and uh, established the church on the day of Pentecost. The next day, the rulers, elders, and teachers of the law met in Jerusalem. Annas, the high priest, was there, so were Caiaphas, John, Alexander, and the other men of the high priest's family. They had Peter and John brought before them and began to question them. By what power or what name did you do this? Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, Rulers and elders of the people, if we are being called to account today for an act of kindness, shown to a cripple and are asked how he was healed, then know this, you and all the people in Israel, it is by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. And then very boldly he said, whom you crucified, but whom God raised from the dead, that this man stands before you healed. He, Jesus, is the stone you builders rejected which has become the capstone. Salvation is found in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given to men by which we must be saved. When the officials heard or saw the courage of Peter and John and realized that they were unschooled, ordinary men, they were astonished, and they took note that these men had been with Jesus. May the Lord bless this reading of his holy word, and to his name be honor and glory. Amen. When they saw the courage of Peter and John and realized they were unschooled, ordinary men, they were astonished, and they took note that these men had been with Jesus. Where have you been? Now, I had to ask that question of myself first before I ask you. Uneducated, common men. That that really wasn't a compliment. Uh, The leaders looked at Peter and John and realized that they were typical peasants of that day. Uneducated, utterly ordinary, however, with extraordinary confidence in what they believed. The Jewish leaders, and they're uh, given there in, in in this scripture, the Jewish leaders, now this was the religious leadership, not the political leadership. Uh, Politically, they were under the rule of Rome, but Rome allowed the, the religious leaders, the Jewish religious leaders, to run the religion part of life. So these leaders were astonished at their boldness. They certainly weren't impressed with their background, but they did realize to their great credit that they had been with Jesus. How did they know that? It certainly wasn't in their education. Uh, It's not like, uh, remember when you used to have perfect attendance in Sunday school and you got a little pen, and then the next year you got a little uh, thing that, that you put on the bottom, and I knew, honestly, growing up, Some people had a pen that had multiple years of of perfect attendance. It it was almost dangerous. If they turned too quick, it might, you know, smack you or something. Well, they didn't have a certificate that said, I've been with Jesus, but rather they knew they had been with him. They had no formal religious training. They had no credentials. It was in their religious pedigree of being with Jesus. 
That was the spirit-filled boldness that they brought to the court that day. Now, in the third chapter, as I mentioned, they had healed a crippled man in the temple. And when a crowd began to gather, as it certainly would, you know, we're kind of drawn to anything that's a little bit out of the ordinary. A crowd began to gather because this man who had previously uh, evidently not been able to walk, now he could walk. So a crowd gathered, and Peter stood up and said, this is a perfect time to preach a sermon, not for the sake of a sermon, but simply to proclaim new life in Christ. Standing in the front, in front of murderers, as it were, in, in the temple there, or rather in the religious court, these are the men he was looking at who had conspired and who had successfully killed Jesus, basically. Uh, and it was in the, uh, the crisis of their arrest brought out the best in Peter and John. Now, how do you explain that? How do you explain uneducated, uh, ordinary men making such an impact in front of very well-educated religious leaders, not intimidated because they were arrested. Uh, evidently, it maybe didn't bother them all that much that they held, had to be held overnight because it was late in the day when they were arrested. How could they dare speak so freely? What was their secret? Would I be able to do that? Would you be able to do that? Where have you been, where have I been that would give us that kind of courage? I often think about my growing up years and the story of the Sunday school uh, badge that we used to wear is just one, one bit of that. I remember my home church was established, I think it was 1949, and our first meeting place was the High Lawn Theater in St. Albans, West Virginia. Uh, we would go there. It, a theater was a, a perfect place to have church because it had a stage up there and the choir was there and so on. And then we started building a, a, a church building. Uh, we built it uh, probably thinking, okay, this is the size church we need. But in those days, church was the place to be, wasn't it? And pretty soon we were full. And you may recall what churches did when all the pews were filled up. They got folding chairs and put up e each side of the aisle. We, we had a center aisle. There really wasn't room enough on the outside aisle, but folding chairs. I don't know that anybody had to stand, but th I'm sure they recruited more people to be in the choir so that it would free up some uh, seats out in the audience. It, it seemed to me like in those days all you had to do was put a sign up that said, a church meets here. That's all you had to do. Next Sunday, you're full. Remember those days? Nothing was open on Sunday. Those were the days of the so-called blue laws, which um, I'm, I, I'm, I'm, I, I kind of have a, a love-hate relationship now with the fact that everything is open. But there are people who are not Christian, so why should we restrict them for our convenience? You can't force people to come to church. You can't force people to be with Jesus. Uh, Christianity is having a diminishing impact on our society, unfortunately. Uh, social institutions that we used to really rely upon, civic organizations that were were the heartbeat of the community that did wonderful acts of charity and that sort of thing. Uh, some of you are members of, of those clubs and it's hard to get people to stand up and say, yes, I'll help with that project. I'll do this, I'll do that. Um, I'm a member of a civic organization that meets weekly and I think what draws us is a wonderful luncheon each week, frankly. And we have good programs. We find out a lot about what's going on in the community. So we bemoan this advance of secularism and the crumbling of social institutions. 
And we wonder why Christians have kind of lost our influence in our world. Maybe it's because of where we've been or where we have not been. The early Christians, they didn't have Facebook. Uh, I can't think of all the other social media that we have. Email, they didn't have the computer, no television, no none of that. In fact, they didn't hardly have any education at all, but they turned the world upside down because they believed Jesus and they were with Jesus. We can be around him and yet not be with him. It's more than just knowledge. Uh, I read one time that going to church does not make you a Christian any more than standing in your garage makes you an automobile. It just doesn't. I mean, there has to be something that touches your heart and opens your heart to God. It's dangerous to be around Jesus because once we're with Jesus, everything will change. So be careful what you ask for. You might get it. And what comes with that is the uh, mission to go forth and make disciples in all of the world. So the disciples started where they were, which was Jerusalem, and they, they fanned out a little bit. And, of course, then along came St. Paul, the, the, really the first uh, missionary. He went all over the known world at that time, uh, founding churches and so forth. And here we are today. Think of all the, the wonderful, wonderful people in our background ready to give an answer for the hope that is in our hearts, ready to be with Jesus. Many of those who heard the word believed, uh, Luke tells us, and the number of believers came up to about 5,000. Now, some of you have been to Jerusalem. You know, it, it's not a real big city. It's much bigger now than it was uh, back in the first century. I wonder where 5,000 people could gather, maybe perhaps uh, in, in, in the uh, courtyard beside the temple uh, that we, the western wall that, that uh, we often go to as, as tourists, but no higher compliment could be paid to a child of God than to say, he's been with Jesus. We want something of Jesus to rub off on us. How about when, we caught, when Jesus was referred to as full of grace and truth? Well, we can be truthful, yes. We can be loving some of the time, but Jesus was filled to overflowing with this truth and with this grace. When we're with Jesus, we can pick that up from him. If we want to be like Christ, we have to speak, uh, seek the spirit of Christ. We won't become Christ-like by accident. Uh, I used to uh, try to come up with a, an easy way to study for a test or something that was coming up in school. Uh, I even thought, well, maybe if I slept on my textbook, it would, you know, somehow get in my head. Didn't didn't work. There's no way around it. It's just simply getting down. I remember one of my professors in seminary had uh, had had a sabbatical leave and he went to Europe uh, to study and he came back and wrote a book on baptism. And he said to us in the class, he said, I wore that chair in the library out, just sitting there day after day, hour after hour, sweating and, and taking in the, the knowledge that he needed to write that book. So if we want to be like Christ, it doesn't happen by accident. It doesn't happen by osmosis like I thought maybe it would when I was younger. It doesn't happen by simply hanging around the church, going through all the motions. We simply don't become Christ-like by accident. This is our challenge. It's our calling and it's our prayer that Christ would be seen in us 
that the Holy Spirit would fill us with grace and truth and that the whole world would know by the way we live that we've been with Jesus. Let us pray together. O oh Lord, we pray you would fill us with your Holy Spirit, that we may be bold in our witness. May our lives show that we have been with Jesus, and it is in his name we pray. Amen. <laughs>